So in the previous flowchart, we looked at climate, specifically macroclimate, and understood that the solar patterns that we observe on Earth, specifically those in relation to solar radiation and solar energy, combined with the Earth's structure and form, are going to give us the many different climates that we observe all throughout the Earth, based off of this latitudinal variation that we see. In this next video, which we'll entitle Climate 2, we're going to continue talking about macroclimate, but sort of, sort of shift gears towards more of a geological understanding of the macroclimate that we observe on Earth. So this will be macroclimate, in parentheses I'll put continued over here. First, in order to understand the macroclimate of the Earth, the large scale climate, we have to understand that most of the Earth is covered in what? It's of course covered in water. And so it's important to understand the influence that bodies of water have on the macroclimate that we observe on Earth. Specifically, when we look at bodies of water, we have to first look at the idea of ocean currents. Because whenever there is land, there is going to be water somewhere nearby. And this is going to be the idea of currents having a great influence on the climate that we see. So we'll say that ocean currents are what influence or influences climates along the coast specifically. And this is key here. We know what the beach weather feels like and we know what water and land and you combine those together you create a beach-like atmosphere that feels different than those that are inland let's say. And this is going to be because of ocean currents having this influence on the land nearby. Furthermore, we can state that ocean currents either heat or they can cool as well. They either heat or cool air masses above. And again, we know that air masses or air circulation patterns are of great interest to us when we're studying macroclimates because of that solar radiation pattern. And when they either heat or cool those air masses, those air masses then inevitably pass over land. So they pass over land and when they pass over land we experience weather based off of these ocean currents as a whole. An idea behind the bodies of water that should be understood is a property of water itself and how it relates to temperature specifically. When we think of bodies of water, we have to remember all the way back from one of our earlier lectures on chemistry and specifically water properties is that water has a high specific heat. And that's an important topic when understanding the bodies of water on Earth in relation to the macroclimate. So we have a high specific heat of water. What influence does this have on the weather that we observe, on the climate that we observe, on the macroclimate that we observe? Because of this high specific heat of water, we know that oceans and other large bodies of water, so oceans plus large bodies of water, both of those will have a moderate climate, usually a rather moderate climate nearby the land that's right next to it. So what we mean by this is that when you have an ocean, when you have a large body of water, it's going to moderate and control that nearby land because of this property. How is that going to be seen? Well, a good way to understand this is through an example of, let's say, a average old hot day. What do we observe in terms of water and what do we observe in terms of the nearby land? How do we have this moderation happening by the ocean, by the large bodies of water nearby the land? So on a hot day, what we imagine is the following. We have air over land. And again, whenever we're talking about climate or weather, air is the key component to understand because that's what has this heat uh, tied into it or this coolness tied into it. If we have air over land, air naturally heats up and rises if it's over land. So air heats up and rises. What's going to happen is a direct sort of effect of this heating up and rising of air. The water right next to this land is going to moderate the temperature by doing the following. This is going to draw in cool breezes. The idea of a cool summer breeze 
comes exactly from the high specific heat of water because this draws in cool breezes from air that's specifically over the water. So this is a very nice if-then format that we have here. If we have hot air on the land, then we'll observe these cool breezes coming in onto the land because of the air over the water moderating that nearby land. All because water can absorb heat very, very well. It does it better than anybody else. This absorption of heat, that's what high specific heat is all about. So that covers this idea of bodies of water and how they influence the macro climate. Another major geological understanding behind macro climate is within the idea of mountains. So mountains are a huge part of the geology of Earth, and mountains themselves, again, we always want to go back to this idea of air. How is air influenced? Mountains directly influence airflow. Mountains, these are going to be influencing airflow. Two main ideas behind mountains and their influence on airflow are based off of the size of the mountain in question. There is what we would term a windward side of the mountain, and there will also be a leeward side of the mountain, both having two different ideas of airflow and how it's influenced. On the windward side, we usually have a release of moisture, and whenever you see moisture and release, you're going to automatically know that rain will definitely ensue uh, soon after this releasing of moisture. On the leeward side, we would have the exact opposite, and thus usually we observe deserts, dry deserts on the leeward side because of the airflow that's either on the windward side, a good amount of airflow, and on the leeward side, very little airflow, and thus we have deserts based off of our understanding of the air circulation patterns that we saw in our previous flow chart. In addition, what we also understand about mountains is that mountains affect the amount of sunlight that is going to reach the land at which the mountain is located. So we'll write that down as affect amount of sunlight. And again, big idea in macroclimate is the sun, solar radiation and solar energy. How does it play itself out on the land that's being observed on the macroclimate specifically? So if we imagine something like the northern hemisphere, for example, let's look at the northern hemisphere, all of the area that is north of the equator. What do we see in terms of mountains and their effect on sunlight? What we have in the northern hemisphere are what we consider south-facing slopes. South-facing slopes are usually going to get more because they're facing the south, they're facing the equator, more sunlight. And if they get more sunlight, it's always in reference to who? Versus their north-facing slope counterparts. And again, this is in relation to the, the northern hemisphere. If I switch this around and send the southern hemisphere, which facing slopes do you think would get more sunlight? In that situation, the north-facing slopes would get more sunlight because we're on the southern hemisphere in this other contrived example because that south facing, the north-facing slope in the south of the equator is going to be looking at the equator, whereas the north-facing slopes would not be. So we have this distinct differentiation between south-facing slopes and north-facing slopes depending on the hemisphere that you're studying. So be careful with that. Understand it's based off of the hemisphere. And because we get more sunlight on the south-facing slopes in the northern hemisphere specifically, I'm going to write that SFS, which would mean south-facing slopes, are definitely going to be warmer and also drier. Uh, most of the time as compared to their north facing slope counterparts so long as we're studying the northern hemisphere. Finally, last thing about mountains, something that most people already understand is elevation. Elevation is key when understanding the macro climate of a region uh, because what we understand through basic geological uh, tests and experiments is that about every 1,000 meter increase in elevation so as you get higher and higher and 
Of course, elevation is referenced to sea level. If we get a thousand meters above sea level, the higher and higher we go, the higher and higher we go from this land that's equal to the sea, about a thousand meters will equal to a six degrees Celsius drop in temperature. So this is, again, an influence based off of the macroclimate, uh, specifically the geology and the elevation that we observe. So that covers the idea of macroclimate in terms of bodies of water and mountains, two big components that we see all over Earth. And as you can see, they have a strong influence on the macroclimates of their regions, respectively.